All right. Welcome, everybody. Well, hello. Let's go ahead and start getting the chat box going. We still got a couple minutes before we'll start for tonight. How is everybody doing? Hello, Jeff and Alex. Good to see you again. Indeed, Alex. Can't believe I only talked to you like four hours ago. <laughs> Right. Sorry, Miss. So yeah, Jeff and Alex. Oh, we already got one like. Thanks, guys. And before we get started, if you guys want to do us a favor and share the link to the video on Facebook, let's see if we can get uh, quite a group going tonight. Share with your friends, with your family, with your acquaintances, everyone you know. Astronomy is cool. <laughs> Luckily, the telling of people astronomy is cool is, I think, one thing we don't have to do with this group. Indeed. One thing's for sure, I am really hoping we can actually do in-person programs. Because yes, there is going to be so much to look at. I hope I get a chance to come down, or I guess up, and do at least one like star party before I go and move away. All the way to me. Right. That nice like five hour drive. <laughs> <laughs> And if you're watching us right now, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box, say where you're viewing from. We like to hear from you and also hear any questions that you have during the show. Yep, and we will have uh, Kate, who is the president of GLASS, if you're not familiar. Uh, she will be handling questions in the chat box. And uh, if every now and then Katya and I will take a peek and if we notice something 
uh, a feel free to ask questions as we go. We'll try to pick them out and answer them throughout the entire show. And we are going to go ahead one sec. All right. We're going to start in about two minutes. Maybe we'll get started a little sooner. Uh, hello, Bonnie, Deb, welcome. So we have uh, two people who will be are great to answer all of your questions. Alex, I have absolutely mm. no idea. An African swallow or a European swallow? <laughs> Welcome, Joyce. <laughs> there you go, Alex. <laughs> uh, good old Monty Python and the Holy Grail references. Apparently 31 to 40 miles per hour, according <laughs> to good old Google. This is back on their stream. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we're about ready to jump in. Uh, before we get started with the show tonight, there is one thing that I wanted to say. Uh, yesterday, we released a statement. Uh, one of the things that we hold uh, very sacred to us is part of the mission that we left Yerkes with that was including uh, equity, inclusiveness, and accessibility in STEM education. And given the recent events, uh, we just want to reiterate our support for the Black Lives Matter movement. And we know that making statements isn't enough. So we are going to continually, as an organization, look for ways for us to take action and hopefully uh, support this movement going forward. And with that, uh, we are going to uh, jump right in to the night sky for the summer. So unfortunately, we are not sure when we will have in-person programs again. Uh, so one thing that we wanted to do with this show is give everybody the opportunity to go out and connect with the night sky in their own backyard. Uh, so. We're going to start, of course, with the most simple thing that you can do from observing. And the first thing we have to do, of course, is move time a little bit forward. Now, as we move forward in time, we're going to let the sun go down below the horizon. Now, the sky will not immediately be dark, as anybody who's stayed out in the side and noticed after sunset, it doesn't get dark immediately. It does take a little bit of time. So we're going to go a little bit faster, and we're not going to stop until we get to about uh, 10 p.m. So now we're looking at the sky as it will look at 10 o'clock tonight. And the first thing we're going to do is the first thing that we always do is you have to orient yourself. Uh, now, tonight, we're actually kind of lucky because if you can already see, uh, Stellarium is really nice about labeling really bright things in the sky. And so the brightest thing in the sky tonight, by quite a margin, is the moon. But down over at the southeast, you can see that the moon shining very brightly. So uh, 
easiest thing to pick out. But the moon isn't always in the same part of the sky, and you'll see that soon as we kind of go over the course of the night, the moon will move through the sky like all of the other stars. And it doesn't give you an exact direction uh, that you're facing. As you can see here in Stellarium, uh, we have these wonderful cardinal directions all the way around us. But when you go outside tonight, or any other night this summer, uh, you might not be lucky enough to have giant red letters telling you which direction you're facing. So now what we're going to do is just spin around a little bit. And you'll see what kind of looks like a fairly uh, empty portion of the night sky. But the closer you look, and especially if you kind of go out in your backyard and look almost straight up, you will see a very well-known constellation that hopefully all of us are quite familiar with. And you can already see the names of the stars in this constellation starting to appear. And we have Al-Qaeda, which is the very tip of the handle of the Big Dipper. Now, uh, the Big Dipper is really great to find first because it contains uh, seven stars, six of which are actually fairly bright stars, making it a very easy constellation to find at night. Uh, also, a lot of these stars have some interesting things about them. Uh, one of them that we want to point out first, uh, because this is all about pointing out things that you can look at and find with the naked eye, is once you've found the Big Dipper, you want to kind of go to the middle of the handle, and if you zoom in, uh, as we can here in Stellarium, you can see that Mizar actually has another bright star next to it named Alcor. Uh, now this is a binary star system, but there are kind of two main binary star systems that we're going to be talking about, a visual binary and an actual binary. Katia, could you tell us a little bit about the, what does it mean to be a visual binary mm -hmm. versus being an actual binary star system? Right. So an actual actual binary star system is you have two stars and they're orbiting each other. So they're going around each other's center of mass like this. Um, a visual binary, it's the stars look like they're together or they look like they're part of the same system, but they're completely separate. They're not like physically bound to each other or anything like that. Uh, one second, Katya. Uh, is anybody having trouble hearing Katya? Oh no. <laughs> Is it not working? Let's see. Oh, we, I just got told. Oh, by hello? Anybody in the comments? A little bit. Alex says we're good. Okay. 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 So maybe, Kashi, if you want to move the mic a little closer, that might be the issue. Yeah, yeah. I will move there. I will move that closer to. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we are all good. Okay. All right. So now uh, we know the difference between visual and an actual binary. And uh, one fun thing about Mizar and Alcor is that they were actually used uh, during the ancient Roman time as a way to judge if you had good enough vision to be an archer in the military. Uh, now, it's actually not a very difficult binary star to uh, make out. So once you go, you can kind of look up, and if you have glasses, as long as you're wearing your glasses, you should be able to separate the two. But try taking off your glasses, if you are a glasses wearer like me, uh, and see if you can still make out the difference between Mizar and Alcor. If you can't, you would not have made it in the Roman military or the, at least as an archer in the Roman military. But now we're going to zoom out a little bit. And we want to talk about why you want to find the Big Dipper first before you find anything else. So let's let it fill the screen quick. So the, one of the great things about using the Big Dipper is if you take the stars at the bottom of the handle, which are Mirac and Dube. And if you take those two stars, connect that line between these two, and you extend that line all the way down, you'll eventually reach a star named Polaris. Now, if you've never heard of the star Polaris, 
then uh, you probably know it better as the North Star. And Polaris also happens to be the very tip of the handle of the Little Dipper. So by using the Big Dipper, which is something that sticks out and is very bright in the sky, you can use it to find Polaris, which also helps you find another constellation and points you directly north because Polaris is also the North Star. Now, one thing I do have to correct myself on is that I refer to the Big Dipper as a constellation. The Big Dipper, however, is actually not a constellation, but what's called an asterism, meaning it's part of a much larger constellation that looks like something completely different. So if we go back up to the Big Dipper, you can see that there are legs to the Big Dipper, and there's also kind of a torso. And it actually turns out the Big Dipper is part of a constellation called Ursa Major. And if you don't know your Latin, Ursa Major is basically just Big Bear. So now that we have Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, uh, you kind of have a really good idea for where you can look to find north. And you can just kind of follow this again, and you have these two kind of constellations here. Now, there's also another constellation to look for when it comes to uh, looking in the northern part of the sky. But unfortunately, this time of year, it's quite low. So it's not going to be that helpful for you to know during the summer, but we're going to go ahead and uh, point it out anyway. So down here, we have the W. Cassiopeia. And so Cassiopeia is one of the other constellations that's uh, in the northern part of the sky and stays up throughout the entire night. It just happens to start the night fairly low in the sky. And if you want to know why that is, there, one of our previous episodes actually uh, dived into that whole process of uh, how the circumpolar region works. So uh, time to maybe go through some of our older episodes. But now we're going to kind of move around the sky and start to look at some of the things that are, are really unique to the summer sky. Everything we've covered so far are things that you can go out at any time of year and pick out. And it just so happens that during the summer, the Big Dipper, or Ursa Major, is very helpful to find another thing. Uh, so here in Stellarium, all of the bright stars are actually labeled. Uh, so we don't really need help finding any of them, but if you're ever not sure which bright star is which, you can actually use the handle of the Big Dipper to find a bright star named Arcturus, as you can see here in Stellarium. So if you follow the arc of the tail and you keep that arc going, you will reach the, the bright star Arcturus, which is part of the constellation Bootes. Now, right now we're facing north, and so we're going to look back up and we're going to spin around until we're kind of facing south. And one nice thing you can do in Stellarium that you can't always do uh, when you're outside is bring up the little cardinal points just to double check that you're facing the right direction. Uh, but another nice tip is most people have a compass on their phones, so if you want to go ahead and use that when you're outside, I wouldn't blame you. But once you have arced to Arcturus, you can also speed on or spike to a star called Spica. And these are two bright stars in the summer sky that are usually, uh, Spica especially, better to find early in the evening. Uh, Arcturus is almost straight overhead in June. And then once we get to August, it'll actually be a little bit lower, and we'll show you what that looks like in a little bit. Uh, now, uh, Bootes was a herdsman, uh, and actually there is another constellation nearby called Canis Venetici, which, oh, I got it, it is right next to Bootes. And those are actually his hunting dogs. And so uh, Bootes also has a fun asterism. If you take this here and you make a triangle out of these stars and then you treat the giant kind of round part of his torso as its own separate thing and get rid of his legs 
Uh, this is an asterism commonly known as the ice cream cone. And so we have the ice cream cone, which how nice to have an ice cream cone up in the sky during the summer. And uh, down here, Spica is actually in the constellation Virgo, which now is fairly high in the sky, already getting kind of close to the horizon early in the evening. But during the spring, uh, Virgo is actually what signifies the beginning of spring because right at the beginning, Virgo is rising in the east right after the sun sets in the west. And that is how uh, the ancient Greeks knew when it was time to start planting their crops. Uh, now, there's something kind of fun about Arcturus and Spica in that they will actually look kind of different. Katya, can you tell us something? Tell us why Arcturus and Spica might actually look a little different? Yeah, so um, when you look at Arcturus Spica through a telescope or binoculars, really, um, they look like they have two different colors. And they actually are two different colors. And they're actually in different points of their kind of stellar life cycle. Um, so Arcturus is a red giant. So it's completely, it's off the main sequence already. Um, and it's actually so huge, it's 25 times the size of our sun. Uh, uh, Spica, on the other hand, Spica is actually also a binary system, but you can't resolve that in like your binoculars or a telescope. But it is a blue giant, so a really big blue uh, star, the kind that live fast and die young, <laughs> as they say. Um, but it is actually still on the main sequence, so using hydrogen into helium. And later on, we can talk more about the life cycle of different stars and all that. And so I bring up Spica and Arcturus uh, because the different life cycles of stars is actually a good thing to know when you're looking around the sky. And we're going to show a really cool example uh, right now, actually. And I'm going to show you then the trick on how to find this, uh, these two stars. So one thing that we're going to do is we're going to find the star named Albireo. Now, when you go outside at night and you find this with the naked eye, you will actually maybe think it, act it looks like uh, one single star that's fairly bright. And, but when you actually zoom in and you get closer and closer, you will see that Albireo is not one star, but actually two bright stars next to each other. And this is yet another binary star system. And uh, as Kati was pointing out that Arcturus and Spica are two stars that are in different parts of their life cycle, uh, these two stars are also like that. So Kati, can you tell us a little bit about Albireo? Yeah, so uh, as Adam said, it is a, well, we think of visual binary actually. Um, I don't think they've confirmed that they're actually orbiting around each other. But in this case, you also have a blue main sequence star and a red giant star. Uh, so stars, when they're born, they're basically born out of a giant molecular cloud of accreting gas. So you have a whole bunch of gas that's coming together, collapsing under you know, gravity. Um, and that forms a protostar. And so eventually, um, it'll gain enough mass that it'll be able to ignite, quote unquote, and start nuclear fusion. Uh, so two like hydrogens smashing into each other, basically. Uh, um, and so once the star starts nuclear fusion, it will be traveling on what we call the main sequence. So the main sequence is uh, what a star, a star is usually on the main sequence for most of its life. Uh, and it's, you know, every single day it'll write in its diary, your diary, I have fused hydrogen into helium. That's what our sun is doing right now. Our sun is a typical, you know, middle-sized yellow-green star on the main sequence. Um, and from there, the life cycle of stars varies depending on a lot of factors like its mass. So if you have a star that is less than eight times the mass of our sun, it is not uh, massive enough to go supernova. Um, instead, 
what happens is that uh, eventually the star, you know, it's using hydrogen to helium. Eventually it's going to run out of hydrogen to fuse. And so it's going to start having to fuse heavier and heavier elements. And as it's doing that, it'll start expanding into the red giant. So one of the stars we have is a red giant in Alberio. Um, it's going to start expanding. And so it'll become really big. The sun, for example, uh, is predicted to be come so big that it'll either come very close to or actually swallow up Earth. So probably want to get off the planet by that time, but don't worry, that won't happen until a couple, you know, million, billion years later into the future. So don't worry about getting off the planet just yet. Yeah, don't worry, that um, won't be another thing that gets added to 2020. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't worry. <laughs> not gonna, not gonna get that worse. <laughs> um, and so um, as it's doing that, um, it will start shedding its outer layers of gas. And eventually what will happen is in what's left of the star, the remnant is called a white dwarf. And that's gonna be kind of in the center. It'll be like the core of the, the shell, the core of the star, just sitting there and kind of cooling off. It's not doing fusion or anything anymore. And surrounding it will be the shedded layers of gas that's being ionized by that white dwarf in the center. So it's making all the electrons and the gas around it really excited and like jumping up and down energy levels. Uh, and so that is what, it, what we call a planetary nebula, where in the nebula is actually the shedded outer layers of the dying star, the dying white dwarf in the center. Um, there's a lot of really good examples of planetary nebula and they're actually really cool to look at through binoculars or a small telescope. And, and we'll we will highlight a few of those later on. Yes, perfect. Sorry. Yeah. I took the T's right out of my mouth. <laughs> uh, we just, you know, great minds think alike. <laughs> um, so now but... we're going to, I'm going to show you guys a really cool trick. Oh, I'm sorry, Katya, were you, were you still going to say something else? I didn't talk about... about the other, the other massives, the more massive stars. Oh. We okay. talked about less massive stars, but really quick if you have a star that's greater than eight solar masses that is the kind of star that you'll see go exploding in a supernova um, and that will eventually create depending on the mass something like a, a really really dense neutron star so the kind where you like pick up like a gram of it and it weighs as much as mount everest uh, you hear those kind of facts about neutron stars they're really really dense uh, either that or like a black hole yeah. Awesome. Unfortunately, we don't have any good examples of that for tonight, but um, there are some really <laughs> cool ones if you go out and search uh, anywhere online. But mm -hmm. uh, so now, uh, Alberio is one of those ones that you can't really tell that there's anything special there until you look at it with binoculars or with a small telescope. Uh, so, one thing that we're going to do is I go through some of these objects. I kind of want to show what they would look like from the field of view of kind of one of the cheaper pair of binoculars. So earlier this week, I went online and I looked at some reviews. I kind of searched around for an affordable pair of binoculars for astronomy. And the ones that I found were called the Celestron, uh, I think the Cometron. And so they're really kind of specialized for looking at comets, but they're basically just 50 millimeter uh, binoculars and they have got wonderful reviews from different art articles and websites that I read through. And they're only $35 on Amazon, which is not bad for a pair of binoculars. But if you happen to have an old pair of fairly large binoculars just sitting in a cupboard, like my parents do sitting at home right now, uh, a lot of these uh, objects are things that you can actually look at using those. So if we go back here and we pick out Alberio again, one cool thing that you can do here in Stellarium is actually set this to see how things will look through binoculars. So as you can see, you can almost just barely make out that there is a separation of these two stars. So you do need a little bit of magnifications to really pick out Alberio as being two separate stars, but a small telescope will definitely do that. And with your binoculars, you may be able to separate them. 
Now, finding Elvirio is, can be a little tricky because it looks like just a fairly faint star, um, still one of the brighter stars in its area, but the best way to find it is to look for what's called the Summer Triangle. Now, if you're already somewhat familiar with any amateur astronomy and you're watching, you can already see that there are three stars that are labeled here that are fairly bright. And one uh, really cool thing to note is that they're very close to the Western Horizon. And uh, their name uh, for these three stars together, uh, this is also an asterism, and it is known as the Summer Triangle. And as you can see, there's a couple other asterisms in there, but if we just turn on uh, the asterism lines, you can see that these three connect Dena, Vega, and Altair. And these three stars are three of the easiest things to pick out at night. Uh, they stick out like a sore thumb, and we constantly use these three stars to help us navigate at night uh, because they are the three of the four or five brightest stars in our sky during the summer in the early evening. Now they're actually each part of a different constellation. So Vega is actually part of the constellation of Lyra. Now Lyra is actually a lyre and goes back to Greek mythology. And I'll, yeah, I'll put the name up there as well. Altair is part of Aquila, the eagle. Uh, representing one of the forms that Zeus took. And we have Deneb that is part of Cygnus the Swan. And as you noticed, uh, the outline of Cygnus the Swan, if you take away the wingtips, is also an asterism known as the Northern Cross. And these are kind of three of the major constellations to look for during the summer as they'll be up in the sky throughout the entire night. Uh, or the, the, they'll be in the early evening sky for the entire summer. That is the much better phrasing of what I was trying to say. And so you can always kind of look for the summer triangle. Now the summer triangle gets its name not because it's always up in the sky in the evening, in the early evening of summer, uh, but because at the beginning of summer, it is just beginning to rise in the west as the sun sets. So whenever something is named after a season in the sky, it typically has to do with it signifying the beginning of that season. So once in the early evening you start to see the summer triangle come up, uh, you'll know, uh, outside from just looking at a calendar, that it is summer. So that is always a very useful designation. And uh, the constellation Lyra actually has one of the other objects that we wanted to point out for tonight. Unfortunately, it's not really a good binoculars object because you need a little bit more magnification as it's fairly small. You may be able to still pick it out, but it'll look kind of more like a star than anything else. So I'm actually going to take these constellations down. And I want to point out an object that's in Lyra. And Katya, I believe you are a big fan of this object. Yes, I am. Uh, I'm assuming, yes, you are going to the nebula. Yeah, so one um, thing I wanted to is... do was, oh, sorry, Kat, I wanted to just say the, this is the binocular view. So as you can see, it just kind of looks like a faint little star there. Uh, but with a better telescope or a great tool like Stellarium, you can get a much better look. And Katya, do you want to go ahead and tell us what are we looking at? Yeah, so you might think when you first look at it, it looks like a little fuzzy donut. Um, but this is actually an example of what I was talking about just a few minutes before of a planetary nebula. And it's probably one of the most famous and well-known examples of a planetary nebula that we have. Uh, it's one of the Messier objects commonly referred to as M57. Um, and this is, even though it looks like a little fuzzy donut in a telescope, it is the shedded outer layers, ionized uh, gas uh, from a dying star, which I find super cool. And so the ring is one of the uh, best objects to look at, with this, even with a small telescope. Uh, big, big fan of the ring nebula. Uh, I don't know about you, Katya, but that was 
uh, almost always on any kind of show or observing session I did during the summer. How about you? Yes, that is actually the first deep space object I ever saw through a telescope. Um, when I went, um, I think it was in Prague, I, I like begged my parents to go to an observatory there and they had like a similar uh, star party show kind of that Yerkes did. And that was also one of the things that they showed was the Ring Nebula. It's a very ubiquitous object, at Definitely. least in the Northern Hemisphere. Yeah, you can't... I've never been to the Southern Hemisphere yet, so I don't know what kind of objects they exhibit there. <laughs> they get the Magellanic Clouds, but they're kind of lucky. Ah, uh, yes. But... I'm very envious. <laughs> but we have the North Star, so I think we made out pretty nice. Yeah. And this summer we've got a couple of other really cool things to look at. Uh, so one other thing that I wanted to talk about is kind of like the naked eye object in our sky and it's over here to the southeast hopefully we're all very familiar with this object we'll take a nice big closer look at this uh so of course here we have the full moon um i actually don't know if the full moon was this was is this night or if it was last night uh, i think but, it's this night yes yeah, so then uh, tonight we'll yeah. have the full moon and then every night hereafter we'll see a little bit less of the moon illuminated as it becomes turns into a waning gibbous into the third quarter waning crescent and the best time to go outside and look for objects in the sky is actually when there is no moon at all the moon is mm -hmm. the absolute brightest thing in the night sky period and so when you have we a full honestly moon... oh go ahead we do not like the moon unless we're trying to observe the moon. <laughs> That's usually how it goes. Yeah, if the moon wasn't something that we wanted to highlight on an, on an observing run, it is just not something we <laughs> want to be up. Yeah, it it very much uh, blocks out and like lights out a lot of really nice faint objects that would otherwise be visible, and so you really have to prepare um, differently depending on what phase of the moon it is. Yes. And so uh, while the full moon is up tonight, we are not going to, I'm not going to be pointing out any of the uh, kind of faint objects around it. So now the next thing that I wanted to point out is something that if you stayed up later tonight, you would actually be able to see, but will be better as we get farther and farther into the summer. Because... When it comes to naked eye observing, the moon is obviously the best. Uh, picking out stars and certain constellations is another great option. And there are sirens going by, so I'm going to apologize for that oh. now. <laughs> Just another quick thing about the moon uh, is if you do want to look at the moon, I would recommend uh, looking at it when it's half full like a first quarter or last quarter moon uh, because that way it's not as bright uh, and you can also if you have you can see the terminator so the line like the, the line where you can't see the other side of it and sometimes you can see really cool detailing uh, and like 3d-ness almost on it um, if you try to look at the full moon it's very blinding and it's very bright, especially if you don't have any sort of lunar filter. Um, so it's not a very pleasant viewing experience. <laughs> right. And uh, by the way, for those of you who said they couldn't hear the siren, uh, looks like the filters on OBS are doing their job. Uh, and yes, oh. Jeff, uh, in smaller telescopes, the ring does look, or, or the, I'm assuming Jeff is referring to the ring nebula looking like a donut, and then larger telescopes yeah. looks like a Danish. Yes, in the 4D, it looks spectacular. Oh, yes, absolutely. Although pointing that high in the sky always makes me nervous. Don't know why. But we'll talk about that later. Yes. <laughs> Foreshadowing. <laughs> So as I mentioned, uh, other bright objects in the sky that will be coming up relatively soon 
And so we're going to move a little bit forward a little later into the night. And you guys can see just coming up over the horizon, just after midnight, around 1220. Something is really going on. All the sirens. I think it's... They're like right oh, behind us. they're coming past. Oh, there's the parade for graduation. graduation. Let me mute myself. Oh. <laughs> yeah, sorry everyone. Uh, the people in Williams Bay are having a parade for the graduating seniors right now. So congratulations to them. Yay. Uh, congratulations to everyone who is graduating this year. Uh, and sorry for the delay. Man, I wish we got a parade. <laughs> right. So now it's just a few honking, a little bit of honking, and seniors driving <laughs> by with their banners. <laughs> Good job, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So as we were talking about, uh, in the sky later tonight will be Jupiter and Saturn. And so down here, it, we can have fun and we can get much, much closer views of Jupiter. And uh, so one of the names around Jupiter is one you'll see here named Almathea. Uh, Almathea actually has a little bit of a connection to a scientist who was at Yerkes. Katya, do you want to tell us why Almathea is kind of uh, unique? Yeah, so it was actually discovered visually at Yerkes, the fifth moon of Jupiter. We discovered visually there by, yes. I don't remember who. That was Barnard. Barnard, there we go, yes. yes. He was the last person to discover a moon around Jupiter vis visibly. The only other person is Galileo, who discovered Ganymede, Europa, Io, and yes. Callisto. And he used a I telescope also... that was actually pretty small. Go ahead, Katya. Yeah. Oh, those were also known as the Galilean moons, uh, named, of course, after him. Uh, and they're actually very prominent. If you look through binoculars or a small telescope, you should usually be able to see at least some of the four, if not all four of them, usually in a line uh, of Jupiter. They're actually pretty cool moons. Um, so Europa is a moon that we believe has liquid water underneath the surface of ice. So I think NASA has been trying to get a mission for a probe to actually go down to Europa to go and sample underneath ice. Um, Io is actually the most volcanically active place in the solar system. Uh, it has a lot of volcanic activity uh, due to how its orbit and how Jupiter will tug on it. So a lot of tectonic action there. Uh, and Ganymede is actually the largest moon in our solar system in general. It's actually even larger than the planet Mercury. I don't know any fun facts about Callisto. That always seems like a, a nice <laughs> rocky moon. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't have any actually fun facts after Callisto either at the moment. But um, Sometimes... Oh. Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. I was going to move on, so say, say what you were going to say. Yeah, no. I was going to say, um, sometimes, I don't actually know if you can see this um, with binoculars or not, but I know at least with the 4D, maybe with a larger, uh, a larger scope, not as large as the 4D, um, you can sometimes get lucky if one of the moons happens to go and pass Jupiter in front, it passes right in front of Jupiter, so you can sometimes see a transit of some of its moons. Yes. Those are really cool. And one of the cool things about this summer is that Jupiter and Saturn are going to be very, very close together in the sky. So if we actually kind of zoom out to how they will more likely look when observing them, they're going to be very close to each other in the sky. 
So now we're going to take a closer look at Saturn. And then we're going to show you what they looked like if you just kind of were to look through um, the binoculars that I mentioned earlier. So here, of course, we have Saturn. And if you look at it through a small telescope, uh, obviously you won't have any of the labels on there. And so we're going to take those off for just a second. And go ahead, Katya, tell us a little bit about Saturn. Yeah, so Saturn is one of the prominent gas giants that we have. Um, it's obviously known for its beautiful ring system and its abundance of moons, actually. It has 82 currently known moons. I think they just discovered 10 little ones like last year. Um, so I think that's actually the largest moon count of anybody in our solar system. Um, and actually, fun fact, a lot of people, when they first look at Saturn through a telescope, they won't believe that they're looking at Saturn. They'll be like, you tricked me. You put a little sticker of Saturn on the, on the lens or on the mirror uh, <laughs> because it, it happens to look so you know, crisp and perfect. <laughs> and uh, one of the cool things, so with binoculars, you might be able to pick out a little bit of it. Um, here, it doesn't seem like Stellarium wants you to actually mm -hmm. be able to see that see it that well, but I'm pretty sure with these binoculars, you would actually be able to maybe make out, at the very least, you'd be able to tell that it is an oval and not actually a circle like all the other stars. But with a small telescope, yeah. you do get a nice, beautiful view like this. And because uh, Gal Galileo was able to observe Saturn like this, even with a small telescope. And now we'll zoom back out and I want to just kind of quickly go over to Jupiter before we talk about some of the other objects in our sky. And so with binoculars, you might actually be able to pick out some of the brighter moons around Jupiter. And you'll be able to uh, hopefully pick out three to four of them. And those are the four Galilean moons. And Galileo was actually able to discover those even just using a very small telescope. Uh, so some of the big binoculars that we have now are, are almost bigger, have bigger lenses than the telescope that Galileo first used to uh, record those moons. But now we're going to zoom out a little bit, kind of look around the night sky, because there's still plenty of other things to point out. And some of the things that I want to point out are a couple more constellations to look at. Um, one of my favorite constellations uh, to go out and find is currently next to the moon. So if you went out tonight, you might struggle to find it because the moon's brightness would actually make some of the stars a little more difficult to see. And the constellation I'm referring to, is, as you just saw, is Sagittarius. Now, Sagittarius it never really gets too high in our sky. It always stays pretty low and closer to the horizon. But Sagittarius is really cool because it also has another asterism that I really enjoy. So if we go and look a little bit closer at Sagittarius and we zoom in, and once I get it to take up a good portion of our screen, and if you ignore all those random little sticks flying off the sides, you start to see a single shape. And this is the teapot. Now the teapot is really cool. Because if you look kind of where the spout is, uh, that is about where the center of our entire galaxy is. And Katya, do you know what the, yes. if, have you ever noticed that on dark nights, there kind of looks like there is steam rising from the teapot? Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. What is that steam? And that <laughs> actually happens to be the band of our own Milky Way galaxy. Uh, so you can kind of see it arcing above the sky, creating the steam coming out of the teapot. Um, on particularly good nights, even at Yerkes, uh -huh. uh, you could very, very faintly see the band of the Milky Way. So yeah, Adam takes out the atmosphere. You can see it very prominently there. Yeah, I wanted to make sure it was extra visible. Unfortunately, um, you do need a pretty good night 
as you can see, especially mm -hmm. with the moon up, uh, there is no hope of going out and seeing the Milky Way tonight. But on a really good night, you can't actually see it. Now, if you notice, um, there's also another asterism in the sky, and you can see it kind of looks like a fish hook. So for any fans of the Disney movie Moana, uh, that has actually the same stars that are used in Maui's fish hook, which is based on a real constellation in that mythology. But we usually recognize it as Scorpius. And right here is a bright red star named Antares. Katya, do you know the nickname for Antares? Uh, well, nickname, but if it, oh, do you mean, I don't know the nickname, but I know that Antares uh, was called, it was called that because of the words anti-Aries, so i.e. anti-Mars. Uh, because you know you have a big red star and you also have a big red dot which is mars and so to tell the two apart that one is anti-aries yes yeah, sometimes referred to as the rival of yeah. aries it's also sometimes referred to as the heart of yes. the scorpion as it's in scorpius uh, right and so here now we have kind of our nice big drawings up there and i like both of these constellations because well once you see the teapot uh, that's all you're ever going to see there. You're never actually going to be able to find the rest of uh, Sagittarius and actually kind of remember it like that. Uh, you basically just need to find the teapot anyway. Uh, Scorpius is one other one I enjoy because it actually, the shape actually kind of makes sense for what it is. And uh, it's just kind of a fun constellation to go out and pick out in the sky. Uh, unfortunately, you do have to make sure there's not a lot in your southern horizon. Uh, otherwise, the tail will get cut off. Now, we're going to take, take these two constellations down. And we want to do a little bit about with some objects. Uh, one of them is going to be a Messier object. Now, we already looked at one or two Messier objects. Or I think just one. Because uh, we looked at the Ring Nebula. And the Ring Nebula is actually sometimes uh, labeled as M57, but not everybody knows where that system comes from, why they're numbered, why there's an M in front of it. Kati, do you want to tell us a little bit about the Messier catalog? Sure. Uh, so there is a whole bunch of different catalogs that are used in astronomy. Messier just happens to be one of the many. Uh, so the M, stands for the initial of a man's last name. Uh, this man was Charles Messier, and he was an uh, 18th century comet hunter in France. And so him looking for comets with big telescopes, which were obviously not as advanced at the time as ours, uh, a lot of things in the sky kind of looked the same, like little fuzzy donuts. <laughs> um, and so he decided to make a list of all of the objects that people should ignore when looking for comets. Ironically, <laughs> even though he meant this as a list that people should ignore, this has become a list of some of the most well-known, uh, ubiquitous, you know, easy to find objects in the night sky that almost, I think, every amateur astronomer observatory, whatever, will point out and show to you on a good night. Uh, especially for at least for the northern hemisphere. Uh, so this list includes 110, though there's technically 109 because one of them is a duplicate pair uh, objects that range from all different types of deep, deep sky objects. So three different kinds of clusters, globular and open, uh, uh, different kinds of nebulae, galaxies, there's a supernova remnant in there, or, or technically it's a pulsar wind nebula, but <laughs> most people just say it's a, it's a, a supernova remnant. Um, and there's just a few other miscellaneous kind of things. So there's a random star in there for some reason. <laughs> yeah, and so a lot of the things that we look at, that we looked at at Yerkes, that in general you can go out and join your nights in your night sky is or will be a Messier object. Right. And there are a couple of Messier objects in the southern part of the sky that I want to point out. 
Uh, now typically when you go outside, you want to look as high into the sky as possible because then you're looking through less atmosphere, which means the light from these objects won't get as distorted because it doesn't have to go through that much air. So we are going to, first of all, I need to get rid of the moon. Now the best way to get rid of the moon is to just simply move time forward. So I'm actually going to show you this kind of a cool tool in Stellarium is literally there's just a date and time window and you can go here and you can just kind of jump forward day by day and watch as the moon goes farther and farther away and everything kind of shifts a little bit uh, and that's something that we actually explained in another video but now with the moon gone you can actually start to see the Milky Way here and how it's kind of a faint cloud all the way across the sky. But what we want to talk about right now is an object that is part of the Messier catalog named the Wild Duck Cluster, which is in Scudum. Uh, now this is one of the better clusters to go and look at as it is much higher in the sky. And I need to select it one more time. Sorry about that. Stellarium gets a little picky if you leave it on too long. And we can now uh, take constellations off. And you can see what this actually looks like even through a uh, pair of uh, binoculars. And as I said, this is simply a $35 pair of binoculars. That is the view you would get. Uh, now, if you're not familiar with the Wild Duck Cluster or what a cluster is, Katya, can you tell us a little bit about clusters and what kind of cluster is the wild duck? Yeah, so a uh, cluster in very simple terms is just a collection of stars that are together. Um, but there's two different main types of clusters that we tend to look at. Uh, the wild duck is an open cluster. So it's a bunch of stars, so there's not very many stars. It's not it's not very dense or anything um, in which uh, all the stars were born together. So they're kind of part of the same family and they're pretty young stars, pretty blue. Um, and they're not really gravitationally bound. So they're not gonna stay together uh, after millions of years. Like most families, they'll tend to drift apart. Uh, it was thought that our sun was actually once part of an open cluster that is now like very much separated throughout the cosmos. Yeah, and this one indeed is a, uh, as Kate points out in the chat box, you think the flock of ducks. Uh, that is why it's called the wild duck cluster. I was able to see the ducks usually, and some people thought I was crazy because they were like, there's no duck in here. I was one I'm of telling you, I could see the ducks. <laughs> Uh, so one thing we can always do is take those binoculars off and get a little bit closer of a look. Uh, and there is the wild duck cluster. A little bit closer up. The wild duck is actually pretty dense for an open cluster. It, it honestly looks a little more like a another type of cluster, a globular cluster, than an open cluster. Lots of open clusters are a lot more sparse than that. Yes, and we will be talking but about globulars a, in yeah. just a moment. Yes. The uh, first thing I wanted to point out is a good way to find stars like this is you can find Altair, and the constellation that this one in, is in is called Scutum, but it's not the brightest constellation, so you kind of have to look for little shapes in the stars. So one cool thing you can find is this little kind of semicircle here and you can use that to help you find something like M11. Now uh, these usually involve uh, looking a little more closely at star patterns and adjusting that to the telescope or the binoculars or just the naked eye however you're trying to look at it. Uh, one of the useful tools to use is called a star wheel and if you guys noticed in the description of this video, if you go down there, I put a link to what's called Uncle Al's Star Wheel. 
And you can actually download that and print it and cut it out and have your own for a star wheel that you can change the date and time and know what is up and when. And so that thing is also a very useful tool. As I mentioned, uh, as I actually forgot to mention, so Stellarium that we're using is a free tool that you can download and use that on your own computer in order to find where these objects are in the sky, figure out the pattern that you can use to find them, and then kind of scan through that area until you find these objects. If you have a smartphone, you can also download, there's a whole bunch of apps that you can use. Uh, Stellarium, there is actually a phone app for it. Uh, another app that I really like using is called Sky Safari. Um, and so they're usually pretty detailed. They'll tell you descriptions of all the objects and all that, what's up, you know, what, what can you see at the time? Um, and they have the feature where if you're outside, you can use the compass feature and you can point your phone up to the sky and it'll tell you in real time what you're looking at. Yes, and so uh, one thing that I've pointed out now is a cluster called Ptolemy's cluster M7, which is just above the tail in Scorpio, or Scorpius. And this one is not a very dense cluster like M11 that we looked at, uh, kind of a fewer stars and us uh, a little bit brighter. So it's kind of a nice one to pick out, but the problem is it's a little bit lower. And if you want to go out tonight and find it, uh, unfortunately you'd be out of luck because it's basically right below the moon and uh, making it almost invisible to anything other than a very large telescope and even then still difficult. So we're gonna zoom out a little bit there. And we mentioned globular clusters. So one of the things that you can find high up in the sky is a constellation, not that. One second, there we go. So up high in the sky tonight is a constellation named Hercules. And it's quite high in the sky and it's very close to Vega. And so if you, we kind of zoom out a little bit to get a better view of the night sky, you can see it's between Arcturus and Vega and almost directly above head. And we are actually currently a couple days ahead of time. So this is the 12th, so whether there's no moon up at this time. And here in Hercules is this cool little cluster right here. And if you look at it through binoculars, you're actually still able to pick it out. Now, Katya, tell us a little bit about this cluster. Right, so M13 or the Hercules cluster is another one of the most famous, common, really cool to look at uh, globular clusters that there is uh, during the summer. So this is the second type of cluster that I mentioned, uh, globular or as they say in some countries, globular. Uh, because it indeed is a globe. It, it is a three-dimensional sphere of stars. It just looks two-dimensional and flat if you're looking at it through a telescope. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is a very, very dense collection of like thousands to millions of stars um, that are all very old and bound together by their gravitational attractions. And so these clusters are like billions of years old, like close to the postulated age of the universe, which is around like 13.7 billion, 13.8 billion years old. Um, and they're beautiful gems to look at in the sky. They also tell you they also have a lot more cool physical properties and they can tell us things about, for example, dark matter distribution in our galaxy, but that's a whole nother story that I won't get into. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I mean, we could make an entire episode out of that. Uh, so stay oh, yeah. tuned for that. But we're I gonna... think we touched upon it a little bit in one of our previous episodes uh, with a featuring Amanda. Yes, we definitely did. Yeah. So go check that out if you're interested. Now, one thing that I want to make sure that we do is uh, make sure that we mentioned uh, kind of the best thing to look at this summer. 
Uh, so we covered a couple of things that you can pick out with binoculars. There's plenty more. So if you go, it's some, uh, some quick searches around, you can find all sorts of objects that you can look. It's also fun just to kind of scan the night sky and see what you, if you come across anything that looks interesting and then figure out what might be there. Kind of reverse engineering looking for objects. But uh, one thing we want to do is manipulate the t date and time again. Because this summer, during August, there are, there is a very notable meteor shower. So up here are the Perseids. And if you notice right next to Perseus, the constellation Perseus. So when you hear about a uh, meteor shower, that actually has to do with the constellation that the meteors appear to be uh, originating from. And Katya, do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, what causes a meteor shower? Yeah, so usually meteor showers are associated with a comet. Um, so when a comet comes close into the atmosphere, the Earth and kind of breaks apart. That's when you see um, a whole bunch of meteors. Uh, specifically for the Perseids, it's associated with, with the comet Swift-Tuttle. Um, and this is probably the biggest, uh, one of the most prominent um, meteor showers that there is during the year. It happens annually, uh, usually every August. Uh, on good years, you can get, I think, upwards of 100, 120 meteors per hour, um, which is insane. Um, we always hosted a star party for that at Yerkes, and sometimes we got lucky with some huge fireballs that went streaking across the sky. Oh, I yeah. wish I could have attended those. But here, uh, now one thing I want to point out is this is exaggerated, the number of meteors that I have going through right now. Um, and so um, hopefully keep an eye on our Facebook page because we really want to this summer be able to do another Perseids meteor shower. Uh, as Katya alluded to, it was something that was done annually at Yerkes. And so we would really like to keep something like that going. Uh, so keep an eye out for any announcements related to that as we will be making that call within the next month or two. Now, uh, the last thing that I wanted to talk about is something that towards the end of the summer is kind of one of the coolest things you can see. Uh, here you can see Perseus. Next to Perseus is a constellation named Andromeda. And so and in Andromeda, there is a very well-known object known as the Andromeda Galaxy. And so we're actually going to zoom actually, in. Oh, go ahead, Katya. Um, sometimes, I know pe some people still do refer it, uh, to it as the Andromeda Nebula because it's probably only been like a hundred, if even a hundred years since we even knew about the fact that there were other galaxies besides the Milky Way. And so for a very long time, when astronomers looked at something like Andromeda, they thought it was a nebula. And they thought it was some, something within our own galaxy. And it wasn't until you know Hubble came around and discovered that we're actually a tiny little galaxy in the midst of a humongous universe and that the universe is expanding. Yes, and I do want to mention, so uh, this really is the size that Andromeda would look through a pair of binoculars. Unfortunately, it will not look like this through a pair of binoculars. Uh, most of those dust lanes are things you can really only pick out by taking images of it and uh, reducing them and making it kind of look like that. But it is actually visible with the naked eye, making it the most distant object you can see with the naked eye. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, something that you kind of have to be in somewhere that's fairly dark. If you're anywhere near Milwaukee or any large city, you will not see Andromeda with the naked eye. Uh, but if you go farther north, uh, and sometimes even out here in rural southern Wisconsin, you might be able to catch a glimpse of it. Uh, but with binoculars, you can actually kind of see the white oval 
the white fuzzy oval that is our closest galactic neighbor. And now this is something that uh, you kind of have to wait until after midnight in August to kind of get a view on. So it's really one of those objects that's at the tail end of summer. So it's one of those things you kind of just get to look forward throughout the entire summer. But with that, unless Kati, you had any other things you wanted to talk about with Andromeda? It's the nearest major galaxy to the Milky Way. And at some point, we're going to merge with it. And so our, our two galaxies will do a little dance with each other. They're going to kind of swirl around each other like this until eventually the two supermassive black holes in the center of both of our galaxies merge into one really supermassive black hole. And though this might seem like a very violent event, like they're two galaxies crashing into each other, um, I don't think there's any threat for Earth or our solar system. Um, uh, at the time, I think all that we'll see is just a lot more stars in our sky. Yeah, might have to rename some constellations, but by mm -hmm. that point, the sky will be so different that most of our constellations probably will actually look very different. Yes, uh, I think it's two billion years in the future. Yeah. So um, nothing too imminent, or well, it is imminent, but nothing too in the near future. But it will be a very cool thing, and our solar system will likely remain completely unaffected. We'll just have many more stars in the sky and mm -hmm. have a big, a much brighter a second galaxy in our sky. But with that, I want to thank all of you guys for joining on tonight. Uh, uh, we can't thank you guys enough for joining us. I also want to reiterate, we will not be doing the live observing session. Unfortunately, as we get closer and closer to the solstice, uh, staying up and not being able to start until midnight was really starting to get frustrating and it's hard to keep people up that late uh, for the observing sessions so we decided for now that we are not going to be doing those live observing sessions so it'll just be the planetarium shows each night uh, that being said we thank you guys for joining us and hope to see you next week when we bring on dr kyle cudworth who is a former director of yerkes observatory that spent many years observing and using the 40 inch refractor for research as we dive into what it is like to operate the great refractor of Yerkes Observatory. Uh, as Katya and I have both operated it for uh, tours, Katya being the one who taught me how to do it. And so we'll have kind of a bunch of perspectives about the great refractor, bring sorts, all sorts of cool images for you guys. So hopefully we'll see you all next week. And if you like these programs, I did put a link into the description uh, any donation is, uh, we are thankful for all donations. So if you guys like these shows, please donate and so we can keep these going. Otherwise, you guys have a great night and thank you for joining us. Thank you.